Welcome to the Orion X Download, where we talk about big ideas and technology. Hello, I'm Dan Olds, and we're back with another episode of the Orion X Download, accompanied by Shaheen Khan, my co-host. And we also have Steve Perrineau with us again for our second part of diving deep into blockchain and Bitcoin. How are you guys doing today? Excellent. Nice to be with you again, Dan. Good to be with you too, Steve. So in this episode, we're going to go through a day in the life of a blockchain and Bitcoin transaction. So what starts it? How do we get going with this? Do you want to send me some Bitcoin, Dan? I don't, but I will for purposes of this example. I'm going to send you... I'm going to go ahead and send you a whole Bitcoin just because I'm feeling generous today. You probably did not look at the price today. No, so I'm, a, I'm a high roller, Steve. I don't have to look at the price. <laughs> if you have to ask. Are you going to send that from your private wallet? Are you going to send it from uh, CoinBank? Or how are you going to do that? I've got my own private wallet. What are the different ways of doing that? Well, you can send from your private wallet. You can send uh, from an exchange where you're actually trading Bitcoin for other cryptocurrencies. Or you can send it from a coin bank. Uh, so there are a number of options there. Obviously, the private wallet is something that sits on your own computer or iPhone or can even be a paper wallet. Uh, if it's on the coin bank of some sort, um, the process is still somewhat similar. You've got a public address and a private key. And so Dan, please send money to my public address. Okay, I will do it. So Dan's uh, client software, his wallet or his coin bank, or if he goes to out there to exchange, is responsible for forming the transaction that is transferring the Bitcoin from him to you. And it's going to include his public address in that transaction information, as well as my public address and the amount of Bitcoin being transferred, in this case, one Bitcoin. And so that's going to be available to everybody who's interested out on the network. So that aspect of the transaction is not encrypted. It's not hashed. It's just, here's a transaction. And these are the public keys that are doing that transaction. And that's what makes it transparent and visible to everybody. We don't know who the real people are, but we know who their public addresses are and if they have permitted everybody to know who they really are, that can be there too, correct? Correct. Okay, where do we go from there then? Well, somebody, some miner, and actually many miners are going to try and take those transactions and block them up and commit them. And there are several stages in that. One initial stage is that they're gonna charge some transaction fee and it's relatively small fee. And when Dan makes uh, the transaction, he can actually indicate in many cases whether he's willing to pay a higher fee for a transaction to proceed more quickly or whether he wants to save money and pay a lower fee, and he doesn't care if I don't receive the Bitcoin for a few hours. Mm. Okay. So we, we know what's going to happen there, Dan. Then beyond that, um, you know, there are private keys at both ends, right? Because Dan has got his private key that he used to actually get the whole thing rolling, to unlock his Bitcoin, as it were, and include it in the transaction. And then I've got my private key. So once everything's been completed, that's what I'm going to need to actually verify that I've received Bitcoin. But before that, there's got to be uh, all the processing on the network and through the mining community. Okay. Now to, uh, to, to refresh, uh, the mining community is the subset of the network that's in the mood to validate and uh, commit blocks and transactions. And they commit blocks by solving a cryptographic hash problem, which is actually quite difficult. 
And so they have to uh, deploy a lot of specialized hardware in order to do that. And there's one winning miner. But uh, they've got to block up a large number of transactions. So there'll be thousands upon thousands of transactions like Dan's included within the single block. And then the Bitcoin network, that block might be about eight or 10 minutes worth of transactions. The, the target is to keep it around 10 minutes. Right, right. And the hashing functions are used in two places. One is for signatures and one is just for that difficult work when we get to that point. Right. And the signatures are the typical public private key cryptography. Um, different cryptocurrencies use different hashing methodologies for the keys. In the case of Bitcoin, it's SHA-256, which is a 256-bit uh, key methodology. And uh, so that's what's used for, this, for the signatures. So we did these diagrams to simplify things a little bit, and maybe we can put that up on the video feed if you have a chance to go see that. Sure. Uh, so let's start with the public-private key. Imagine that these keys are just you know, uh, paint chips. And when you mix paint colors, you get mixtures of paint. And it's easy to tell for you how you got it. But if you just give me the resulting paint, it's hard for somebody else to figure out what exactly the shades of paint you mixed you get there. And the proportions and all of that. Sure. That's a good analogy. Yeah, exactly. Right. So let's say that uh, the sender and the receiver ag agree on a public common key. And that's the that's a red color, and let's say that uh, the sender picks yellow as their private secret key. Uh huh. Uh, nobody knows about that. That's just they know. And then the receiver has a, a blue private key. Uh, now you got three paint chips in total, and if you mix those three together, it doesn't matter what order you mix them in. You're going to get with the same result at the end, and that's really the crux of it is that I take the public red paint and I mix it with my yellow and I get an orange. I send that orange to you. Uh huh. You get that orange and uh, you add your blue private to it and you get a brown. Okay. You, on the other hand, take the public key red, add your private paint blue, and you get a purple. You send that paper purple to me, I add my yellow to it, and I get the same brown that you did by adding blue to my orange. Without me disclosing my private secret key to you. To anybody. That's right. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know what your secret key is, and you don't know what my secret key is. All I know is that I'm pretty well guaranteed that you got the same color as I did. So now we both have the same shared secret key that nobody knows about. And we, even we don't know, I mean, I don't know what your private key is. All I know is that with whatever magic, I got a glimpse of it in the mixture that you sent me. That purple had whatever you needed to have that got added to red to give me that. And I can't decompose that either. And that's, I mean, I think that's the point to make is while we're talking about paint chips and colors, you know, what to paint your bathroom, what we're really talking about is, what, 128 or 256 uh, bit characters. 256 well, exactly. characters. Yeah. And, and basically, really, really large numbers. Yes. And, 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 and really, the next step, once you figure this out, is to figure out a way so that the sender and the receiver don't have to actually coordinate like we just did. That, you know, all I need is uh, your public key and my public, you know, and, and, and my public key and my private key, and I'm good to go. And so eliminate coordination between sender and receiver. Mm. The other thing you want is essentially you're looking for a suitable so-called one-way function. A one-way function is a function that is really easy to compute in one direction, but it's almost impossible to compute in the reverse direction. Like our mixing of paints. Like our things, right. So the mathematical equivalent of that is really what we're looking for. And okay. there are several models, you know, generally modular or arithmetic is 
the place where mathematicians go to get these things. And then there's a newer one called the elliptic curve algorithm, and it's like increasingly moving in that direction. But it all involves like really large prime numbers and modulo arithmetic and, you know, Fermat's theorem, and really complex stuff. It's one of my favorite theorems. Oh, you know, the Chinese remainder theorem. I don't know if you ever had any uh, problem in algebra that needed that, but it's pretty complex stuff. And the reason it works is that because it's modular arithmetic, you can have multiple questions that yield the same answer. And then you don't know which question actually it was that yielded it. Ah, okay. So then the other thing that you need is to find a really fast way to encrypt really large documents, because that can take a long time. Right, so uh, basically what we just talked about is known as an asymmetric way of sending and receiving keys, is that everybody's got their own keys and all that. Until recently, you kind of needed to have symmetric keys, which is both sides have the same key and they have to share it somehow. This is how like, you know, secret communications were managed during World War I kind of a thing. Like, a, one, kind like of a, a, thing. a one-time pad, they used to call those. Right, right. So you needed like, uh, you know, trusted couriers that would uh, take these keys from one side to the other side. And everybody has the same copy of a book and they do that. Right. Yeah. Right, right. So that leads to kind of the hash functions that Steve mentioned. And those are all in the SHA, the SHA family, you know, SHA-1 and then move to SHA-2. And SHA-2 includes SHA-128 and SHA-256, as, as Steve mentioned. And it's sort of increasingly going to SHA-3, which is kind of another new algorithm. So that's another hashing function is a, another one-way function to rapidly transform a message of any length to a so-called digest of fixed length. So mm -hmm. it can send me you know, a PDF of 55 pages, and I hash it to a single string of characters with 256 bytes. Hmm. That's right? some serious hashing. Well, once I do that, I can do a really quick job of encrypting decrypting that short fixed length hash, and that's the basis of doing a digital signature. Okay, gotcha. All right, so now if you go to... Okay, now that I've got the public key and the, and, and the, and the hash key, how do I now send the message in a way that you can be assured it was from me and it is encrypted? So basically, if I have an original message, I use your public key to encrypt it. Mm -hmm. I encrypt it, I send it to you. Because I used your public key, nobody can decrypt it except you using your private key. So you decrypt it using your private key and you've got the original message. Life is good, except that you want to be sure that it was actually me sending it to you. Okay. So I send you an accompanying message. And in this time, I get the original message Instead of encrypting it, I hash it. I get the message digest, and then I encrypt that, except that this time I encrypt it with my own private key. Now, that means anybody can decrypt it, but once they decrypt it, they just are going to get this hash that means nothing. You decrypt it with my public key, and you get the same hash that I had, except that for you it has meaning because you've got the original message in the previous communication. So now you can hash that, and you should get the same message digest. Gotcha. And so you compare those two, and if they're the same, then you know that you've got an original document that was actually sent by me because that was my digital signature. Okay, gotcha. It is pretty brilliant, isn't it? Hmm. It is. That is... That is brilliant. So now that I have this transaction and I have just sent it to the network, so to say, so as a, as a, if, I have a, if I'm running the client software on my node, I am eligible to receive all the transactions that are happening. I may kind of ignore them, but if I'm in the mood to be, become a miner, then I will pay attention to them, right? Yeah, absolutely. And if you're just, you know, a little individual miner, you'll probably join a pool so that you'll get paid at least more frequently, if not in large amounts. Yeah. It's about the only way for a little guy to get a break in this game. 
So whether Dan has got his uh, private wallet initiating the transaction or whether he initiates it from a coin bank, the transaction goes out to the network. And really the network is those who are interested. Anyone can join the network. But how does it sort of all hang together and communicate with each other? Shaheen, do you have any insight into that? Uh, what I read was that your client software, there's a list of IP addresses that are known to be running the transaction validation and block validation software that are known to be miners. And uh, the system goes there, and if, but of course people come in and go. Miners can be a miner today and not tomorrow, maybe not anymore. I think these days people who mine do it for a living. But uh, uh, it can be updated, and it is hard-coded with uh, DNS records of a few sites that keep track of these things. So if all else fails, they'll kind of go there and then rebuild the list of all the IP addresses that are communicating and participating in this thing. Okay. So... Basically, you reach out to a bunch of people, and they can reach out to other people. It's kind of like LinkedIn. You can get to anybody after about three hops. So all of these peers can discover each other. And the network is this thing which has become so large and self-sustaining that it's, it's going to continue ad infinitum. And the bigger the network gets, the more of a previous record exists of who all is participating in this. So now the transactions are sent to all of those nodes. So regardless of whether Dan sent the transaction from a private wallet or from a coin bank, it's sent out to everyone interested on the network, the miners in particular. And they're going to do some initial evaluation to make sure the transaction looks like a on the face of it, it's valid, and then they're going to start chucking those all together in big blocks and start a race to try and be the miner that completes the block by solving the appropriate cryptographic hash problem. Okay, well, that seems like a pretty good place to stop for this episode, and we will come back in the next episode and discuss this more and finish it out. Thank you all for listening. Mm -hmm.